us that. Let's begin our meeting. Let's pray. Come before the Lord. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come in the beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ, and ask now, O Lord, thou would speak to our hearts and <coughs> testify to us of the great things of heaven and of the gospel. O Lord, we ask thou would help us at our point of need and be to us a great physician, be to us a saviour. We ask these things in our, in our saviour's name and his blood and his righteousness and to the glory of God our Father. Amen. Amen. Our first name is 853. 853. <coughs> oh, for a heart to praise my God. Shall we stand to sing? <laughs> Well, let's turn to the Gospel of Mark as we continue in our series and just read from chapter 3 and uh, verse 7. I also want to read in the parallel passage too in Matthew. But first of all, Mark, Mark chapter 3 and verse 7. Hear the word of God. <coughs> but Jesus with you himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Eudemea, and from beyond Jordan. And they were, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples, that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him, as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. And then the parallel passage in Matthew 12 and verse 15 to 21. 
Matthew, Matthew 12, verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flux shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. As you see, some added information there in Matthew uh, to our passage in Mark. So these two passages, um, Mark 3, verses 7 to 12, and also Matthew 12, verses 15 to 21. And uh, we will make more of the uh, parallel passage, uh, the uh, passage from Matthew tonight than usual. Uh, sometimes we just refer to them and bring in the differences, but there's quite a bit, a bit added here with Matthew, and it's worth going through those words and add them onto uh, the passage in Mark. The words in Matthew are actually the part that's different. It's a quotation from Isaiah chapter 42. And there are four servant songs in Isaiah uh, about the Messiah. And uh, this is the first of the four servant songs uh, in Isaiah. Uh, the famous one, of course, being uh, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. So this is one of the series of four servant songs that Matthew refers to uh, in chapter 42 of Isaiah. But come back now to Mark and chapter 3 and uh, there you see in verses 7 and 8 uh, you see how this passage and likewise the same with Matthew follows on from the healing of the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath day and the opposition of the Pharisees uh, which led to them plotting to destroy him and in league with the Herodians Pharisees and the Herodians joined together to plot uh, his murder, essentially. Well, uh, verse 7 and 8 uh, to begin with. Uh, but Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And so, following that uh, controversy on the Sabbath and the plot of the Pharisees and the Herodians, we see our Savior here uh, withdrawing himself. And that's significant uh, because it was to do with the Pharisees and the Herodians. And he withdrew himself. Uh, with the disciples uh, to the seaside, uh, the shores of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Now, uh, this place where they were and where they were before uh, with the, uh, the synagogue <coughs> and the healing of the man with a withered hand might have been Capernaum, uh, and uh, the seaside might have been just by Capernaum or further down the coast. Or it might have been a journey from some other city and some other synagogue, which was somewhere on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. There is a suggestion with withdrawing from the Herodians and Pharisees that it might be in some distance from where he was, uh, just to withdraw um, from Capernaum to the shores of the Galilee, right by Capernaum, is hardly withdrawing. So whatever it was, it was probably some distance from uh, where the miracle took place, the man with the withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. 
how he was trying to get away from the plotting of the Pharisees. And the reason for this, no doubt, was <coughs> that it was not yet time uh, to be put to death, as we saw on Good Friday. The remarkable determination, even bravery, you could say, uh, of our Savior, uh, crossing the brook Kidron and going to Gethsemane, knowing what was before him. He was not one to hold back. Indeed, his coming was all about going to the cross. But here, of course, he does withdraw for a purpose. It was not yet his time to be put to death. Uh, much more must happen before the appointed time of his dying and saving us from our sins on the cross of Calvary. But see here in these verses, seven and eight, uh, the main theme of the passage is brought in, the great multitude who had traveled from near and far to follow him. And it's quite a thing. They came from far. Uh, you know, they were not like a, a day trip. Uh, they came from far to follow him. And uh, they had heard what great things he had done. Now, probably, almost definitely, there would have been the healings and, and the miracles. But of course, we know much greater things Christ would do for the souls of men who would trust in him. And we'll see in Matthew uh, there's a hint of this, that not all were there uh, for the healings and the miracles, even if that was the cause of them going there in the first place. Many of them found Christ. Uh, there's a hint of that in Matthew when he mentions the Gentiles trusting in Christ. We'll come, we come back to that uh, in, in a moment. But take note now from where they came. They came from north, south, west, and east, uh, from all over Galilee, Judea, uh, and Jerusalem to begin with. Then also Eudemea, or the part of Edom, which was to the south of <coughs> Judea. And also from beyond the Jordan, or the east of the Jordan, which would be the regions of Perea and the Tarans. And then to the north as well, uh, north of Galilee, in Tyre and Sidon. Essentially, north, south, west, and east, they came to follow Christ. Great draw, uh, people making their way to Christ. I just note now, uh, because I want to mention again later, in these regions, uh, there will be Gentiles. And Matthew makes it clear that it was significant that Gentiles were amongst the Jews who came to Christ even here uh, at this early time in his ministry and testifying uh, that he would be the savior of the world. But of course, even earlier than this, the Samaritan said he's the savior of the world. And so he is. But it is a wonderful scene. And it speaks of things to come. Uh, the apostles will go out to the world, and the world will come to Christ. Uh, we see here a missionary spirit and a world-wide view uh, of gospel preaching. That should be on our agenda, every local church. You know, in times of blessing, you see that, uh, whether it is locally, uh, in the regions around, or even across the seas. It's always this traveling. Uh, the gospel preachers of the early church and also of other times of blessing were known for their traveling. If I remember rightly, I think uh, William Williams traveled over 100,000 miles on horseback, but they were all traveling. Some didn't, uh, Daniel Rowland didn't, but many others did, of course. Uh, George Whitfield and Wesley went to America and so on. This missionary spirit uh, is a natural produce of, of the gospel, uh, reaching out, always reaching out, uh, locally and beyond. Uh, the spread of the gospel, the Great Commission, go, go. Not just stay, although that's necessary too, to preach where you are, but also go. And uh, that <coughs> missionary spirit of the church, uh, I just note in passing here, as we see all the peoples come to Christ. And uh, 
sometimes we can get almost uh, too focused on ourselves, not realizing the gospel is throughout the world and uh, the saints in all those places and unbelievers too who need to hear the gospel. Well, look at verse 9. Uh, and he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, as they should throng him. So the scene here is by the shores of Galilee, the seaside, as it's called, and uh, the crowds gathered around uh, the seaside. Uh, our Savior, no doubt, had uh, his back to, to the sea. Uh, that seems to be the suggestion here, uh, with a small ship ready uh, to, uh, to collect them and allow them to depart safely. It's one possibility, we don't know for sure. Uh, it's suggested because they thronged him. They, uh, uh, Christ asked for a small ship to be ready and maybe to make a, a safe departure. Um, now, of course, our Savior could remove himself from the crowd with some miraculous act. It was not always his way. And it's worth noting, he does give due attention to the practicalities of life. And uh, my father had a phrase, he often hears, I, I don't believe in playing with providence. Uh, you do the practicalities. Uh, the practicalities are of the orderings of God as well. And uh, even with our Savior, um, you know, who could do the miraculous, he did give due attention to the practic practicalities uh, of, of everyday life, as he does here. Of course, there might have been some thought of preaching from the ship itself, because that happened in the next chapter. We see that in chapter 4 and verse 1. You'll see there, again, by the seaside, and here, he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. So it's a similar scene. In that case, he actually went into the ship, uh, no doubt uh, being in a better position with the crowds thronging him. Um, and, you know, from a practicality point of view, uh, to have some space uh, between him and the people, more people could see him. Uh, in that situation. In a way, it's a kind of a pulpit, uh, the small ship. And the shores would be the front pew, uh, you could say, in a manner of speaking. And then in verse 10, uh, more detail about this uh, thronging, this great, great multitude. That's been a very, very large crowd. For he had healed many, in the insomuch that they pressed upon him, or to touch him, as many as had plagues. And uh, the crowds were thronging him and pressing upon him. So, you know, there was no space, was there? Hardly. They were pressing upon him, so to touch him. So they were in touching distance, the people. Um, it's quite a scene. Uh, and he heals very many, we told him, Mark. Now, Matthew tells us he healed them all. Matthew 12, verse 15. He healed them all. Get a similar situation in the passage we looked at in Mark um, chapter 1, I think. Uh, casting out the unclean spirit of the man in the synagogue in Capernaum. At the end of the Sabbath, crowds came to him at the end of the Sabbath uh, after the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And there Mark says he healed many. But Matthew says, again, he healed them all. It shows us really the wonderful nature of our Savior. Just imagine being there and wanting to see Christ. And it's like, you know, uh, the door shuts, no more, uh, come back tomorrow or something. Uh, it was not like that. Our Savior gave himself and he healed them all. All who came to him, none were ever turned away. And we know that's true spiritually. All who truly come to Christ, he will never turn away any soul ever. But likewise, with the healing of the body, uh, such was his sympathetic, kind, uh, 
tender nature, uh, he would heal them all. Uh, whatever, whoever they were, he would heal them all. And many, of course, would not be saved, would turn away. And yet, he healed them all. They were told they came with their plagues, which is a, a way of speaking of illnesses and sicknesses. But it is a lovely sight, I say again, uh, those who had plagues and uh, poor, needy infirmities and around, thronging around, the tender-hearted, great physician. Um, it's a lovely scene, it's a very tender scene. It's a kind, kind scene. But then we know, also, we know something else. They press on him so to touch him in order to be healed. So it wasn't just uh, Christ uh, touching them or commanding whatever ailment it was to depart, but they would just touch him so they might be healed. Uh, in Mark 6, verse 56, uh, we have an example of that, and it's more clear what happened. There it says, and besought him that they might touch if it were but the border of his garment, as many as touched him were made whole. And then again, in going back a chapter, Mark chapter 5, verse 27, the more famous example of the woman with the issue of blood. Uh, and when she heard, had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. As Christ said, who touched me? Well, I don't know what you think. It just makes you think, who is this, this man? Who is this Savior? That to touch him would heal the body. You know those words of the Old Testament, um, healing in his wings. He comes with healing in his wings. How true that was. Uh, he was the healer of souls, but also the healer of the body. A great, great physician. And uh, it just speaks of the remarkable nature uh, that he was the son of God, God himself. And uh, a touch was enough. Of course, we think of our souls, especially, and to touch him with our faith is enough for us to be saved. Uh, just that genuine reaching out of the heart, uh, touching of Christ uh, is enough. I speak, of course, of faith of the heart, that when we truly reach out to him, we shall be saved. A look is enough, is another way of putting it. A look is enough, if that look is true faith. Likewise here, the language of a touch is enough, because he is the savior. He's all salvation. He's salvation in his very being. And when we touch him, we touch salvation. We touch the blood, the cleansing of the blood. We touch righteousness to cover us all together. We touch life, the quickening life of the soul, the resurrection. Life, the quickening life of the soul, the resurrection, and the life. In verse 11 and 12, it goes on. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. So not just people with plagues, but also those with unclean spirits were in the crowd. Now, why they came, uh, we don't know. Uh, perhaps to be troublesome and a nuisance, to oppose him. Or perhaps they were brought by others who were concerned for them. Whatever the reason, they were there. We note the description. We haven't touched upon this before, but making a bit more of it tonight. Unclean spirits. Just think, this description of evil spirits and demons. Unclean spirits. It speaks of their vile and filthy and evil and hateful character. And they are just that. They are unclean. And what a contrast in the name of the Holy Spirit. In Welsh, a respirate gland the clean spirit, the Holy Spirit. 
One is unclean and filthy, the other is holy and clean. And so we see the difference. And of course, in, it doesn't say so here, but I have no doubt you would have cast out uh, the unclean spirits. Uh, and he forbade them uh, to, to speak of him. See uh, what happened. Uh, these unclean spirits recognize Christ, I suggest, and they fall down before him because they would have known him. They were of the heavens, had been cast out. Uh, they would recognize him. And uh, they said, uh, falling down before him, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And our Savior charges them not to make him known. Why? Why did the Savior say not to make him known? For one thing, it was not their place. There was no praise he wanted from demons and unclean spirits. But maybe also, and something we've mentioned many times so far, he did not want, did not want too much attention to his identity as the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, yes, to set up the Jews, and eventually set up the Pharisees who wanted to destroy him. As I said, it was not yet his time to be put to death. That may well have been the reason. Uh, more surprising is the parallel verse, uh, verses in Matthew. Uh, it's not just uh, the unclean spirits were told not to make him known. Matthew 12, verse 16, and there we read, uh, to those healed, uh, the many with plagues who were healed, and he charged them that they should not make him known. Uh, probably for the same reasons. Unless that is another reference to the unclean spirit. But it doesn't say that in Matthew. It says, he charged those who he healed uh, not to make him known. Now, it might be for the same reasons, as I said, with the unclean spirit, um, not to want a premature crisis. But also Matthew goes on uh, to hint at other reasons for this restraint more to do with his character. That's one of the striking things between Mark and Matthew. We learn something here of his very character, the character of his ministry and the character of his person. You know, how much we want to know what was he like. And there's an insight here into what he was like as a person and his characteristics. So let's come to Matthew then and, and uh, go back in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 12 and verses uh, 17 to 21 in particular. Uh, 15 and 16 are essentially the same as in Mark. But uh, Matthew takes it on to a different place in verse 17 to 21. Uh, and it is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he refers to Isaiah chapter 42 and the first of four servant songs, uh, these old Old Testament, glorious Old Testament descriptions of the Messiah. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, uh, one of them being Isaiah 53, the more famous. But there's four of them, uh, Isaiah 42, this one, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50, and Isaiah 53. This is the first of the four servant songs, as they're called. Um, by all means, uh, look it up if you want. Um, Isaiah 42 and verse 1. I, I'll just read it quickly so we can see how it uh, cross-refers to uh, what, what Matthew says. Uh, Isaiah 42 verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up. No cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till uh, he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Now, Matthew, it doesn't use it word for word, summarizes those words. Uh, but the meaning is, is the same, and some of the phrases too. So look at verse 18. 
or Matthew 12. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. That servant song, there you see it, Behold my servant. It's a father speaking of the son. Behold my servant. And he speaks of him as the beloved, the beloved son, my beloved whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. Now those words remind us, of course, of the words of the Father in the New Testament. In a sense, the Father in the New Testament uses these words uh, attributed, attributed uh, to him uh, in, in the Old Testament. And of course, it was at the baptism and the transfiguration and there uh, we see a voice from heaven. Thou art, my thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And again, the same with the transfiguration. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And uh, their words of affection <coughs> and uh, of bond uh, and of intimacy. Um, thou art my beloved son, my servant, in whom I am well pleased. Also, uh, go back to uh, Matthew 12, verse 18, I will put my spirit upon him. And also those words were used in his baptism. Uh, and uh, or not so much the words used, but it refers uh, to what happened in his baptism, where we read of the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there in our text here, I'll put my spirit upon him. This, of course, was the anointing. He was baptized in water, but also baptized in the spirit. Uh, we learn from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Um, For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. It was without measure. What an anointing. An anointing, an unction like no other. As he preached, his great anointing was on his words. The power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever felt the anointing in your heart uh, during the preaching or some other occasion? It is a mighty experience. Well, who can describe this anointing upon Christ without measure? Without measure. It's quite a quite a thought and of course as he preached here that's the context here to the Gentiles and the Jews too from north, south, west and east uh, he preached but the emphasis of course in Matthew uh, is on the Gentiles as he preached the truth to the Gentiles who were present on the shores of Galilee uh, it was with his unction uh, it says there in verse 18 he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. In other ways, in, in other words, he will he will show and preach the truth, the ways of the Lord, to the Gentiles, uh, and show them how they sinned, come short of the glory of God, and how they need a savior. So the truth was preached to the Gentiles in the power of the Holy Spirit here uh, on the shores of Galilee. Then in verse nineteen. Here we come to this uh, insight into the character of our Savior and his ministry, his personality. You could say even, he shall not strive, nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Now, for one thing, it's a contrast with the Pharisees, a very different nature to them, making, it, making a display of their religion our Savior was not like that. Uh, he was not showing off himself or making some display or performance. Um, and also, uh, these words, uh, read them again. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. It's a contrast to the worldly, riotous kind of behavior. Uh, the shouting on the street, you know, sometimes if you live in some parts of Cardiff and late at night, you hear 
bawling and shouting, um, people arguing with one another. Or uh, perhaps especially a contrast between uh, those worldly movements of protest, political uprisings. They're always loud, aren't they? Um, there's been some legislation and uh, issues about the loudness of protest, whatever you think of that. Uh, but they are always loud and banging and shouting, singing and so on. Uh, our Savior was not like that, not like those worldly uh, uprisings, political uprisings. Rather, we are told here, uh, there was no shouting out or riotous behavior, but rather a calm, a humble power. You could say, uh, no ostentation, posturing, display or show, or noisy commotion. It was a quiet revolution, perhaps we might call it. Uh, but there was composure with our Savior, and there was not this rowdiness with him, uh, but rather what we see here, no striving, no arguing, uh, no bawling. Uh, and uh, when he came to a place, uh, there was no uh, commotion like that uh, from himself, but quietly and uh, powerfully with unction preached uh, to the people and healed them and preached the gospel to them. Uh, it reminds you of the words of our Savior uh, himself uh, in Matthew 11. For I am meek and lowly of heart. And uh, John says in John 1 verse 14 uh, that he was full of grace and truth. And so we find this combination of grace but truth. Uh, the powerful, not just truth, but you know, anointed truth, powerful, powerful truth, but married with grace and this gentleness of his spirit. He preached the truth with all graciousness. Now, I don't know what you think. Are you not drawn to such a savior uh, who is not like the men of this world? Uh, even preachers can be full of themselves. I don't know what you think. I've said this many times. And uh, uh, I trust I don't fall foul of this myself. But when you hear preachers enjoying themselves and being eloquent and full of themselves, uh, I don't actually put my hands to my ears, but I do in a way. I can't bear to hear it. Uh, I find it so discordant and uh, I find it just uh, so annoying and uh, abominable even. But our Savior is not like that. Uh, he is gracious in the spirit and full of truth and uh, a savior surely uh, you'll be glad to listen to and believe in uh, the most perfect savior uh, in a minute we'll sing this hymn uh, which we believe is by john calvin and there we see the words thou hast the true and perfect gentleness no harshness has thou and no bitterness Oh, grant to us the grace we find in thee that we may dwell in perfect unity. And much of the hymn is in that vein. But you know, we're all poor and needy and we're all trembling souls. And uh, the Savior doesn't frighten us, uh, but rather uh, he speaks truth which will make us tremble, but he's there with an eye for the soul as well. And you have the great marriage, the perfect marriage of the fearful truths of God and also the grace and the kindness of God to the souls of men. What a savior. This is a savior you'd want to believe in and I trust you have. He's a perfect, perfect savior. All you would want in a savior. Then in verse 20, it goes on, more to do with the character of his ministry, perhaps here now as well, as his personality. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment and to victory. And uh, here we see him tending to the poor and needy, a bruised reed, 
he will not break. A smoking flux, he will not quench. Uh, a bruised reed would be like the reeds in the wetlands, are damaged by the wind and, and they bend over and they bruise and, and they're broken in a way. Uh, a smoking flux would be the wick of a lamp, uh, which has barely a flame to it, maybe just a glimmer, a glow, but no or smoke. It's describing the poor and needy, uh, the feeble and the damaged. Well, aren't we all damaged, do you think? We're all damaged. And we thank God our Savior does not, does not break uh, the bruised reed or quench uh, the smoking flax. He speaks of his tenderness and gentleness, so different to the Pharisees, time and time again. They're more concerned for rules and their reputation. They have no heart. You know, the woman caught in adultery, they were stoned her just for the purpose of catching Christ out. Yet Christ showed them they also were great sinners. And uh, the one without sin to cast the first stone. And the Savior, wonderful answer, you know, um, saying, no, nor do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. And you can't devise or design a better answer. Full of compassion, but no compromise. Uh, be saved from your sins. Don't play with sin, uh, but you're forgiven your sins in me. Well, there's nothing more we can say. It's the most perfect gospel and most perfect savior. But these words don't just speak of Christ not harming the feeble and the broken, uh, not breaking the bruised reed. It's hardly a great favor. Uh, here's a bruised reed. I won't break it. Uh, or here's the smoking flux. I won't put it out. Well, it is a favor of a kind. It's not the height of favor. No, it is a uh, form, a figure of speech to say something positive in a negative way for emphasis. For you grammarians, it's called a litotis, uh, where for dramatic effect, to say something positive, you put it in, in, in a negative. That's a way of saying that Christ will strengthen the bruise reed. And also, he will fan to flame the smoking flux. That's what it really means. And that, of course, is the great favor. Recently, we looked at Zechariah 12, verse 5. And there we saw the words, and he that is feeble among them at the day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God. And uh, our interest there, particularly tonight, is the feeble. The feeble shall be as David. Uh, that's the great work of the ministry, to take the feeble, to make them as David. And those who are stronger, uh, the house of Israel, to be as God, to be Christ-like and God-like. This is our great work, isn't it? Preach the gospel, but build up the saints. That's a big part of the work, to build up the people. And this is what we see with the Savior. When he comes across a soul, time and time again, you'll see it in the gospels. Uh, when there is a true desire for Christ, but they are weak and feeble, our Savior comes down to where they are and takes them on from where they are. And such a gift for that. Uh, you think of our Savior, who he was. Think of those of little faith and uh, feeble and weak and feeble. And our Savior went down to them and then didn't leave them there or encourage them to go further back, but rather to take them up and on. That is the nature of our Savior and how glad many of us have been for that characteristic of Christ. When we have failed him, he has come to us and already we feel the condemnation but very soon uh, he says to us, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. One more comment on this passage, verse 20. 
Um, oh, sorry, one more comment in this verse 20 before we come to verse 21. Uh, Till he sent forth judgment and to victory. Uh, what does that mean? <coughs> it's in the context of the smoking flux and of the bruised reed. Um, it's saying this, that this will be the gospel way forevermore through the ages until Christ comes again. This is our gospel for all ages to come. And here we see something <coughs> of the tenderness and the victory. Although our Savior, I say it carefully, but it is biblical, is mild and retiring, and yet also is victorious. And this is something we see in our Savior. Now, this combination uh, is almost surprising to see, isn't it? That our Savior being of a retiring nature. It's remarkable uh, to be meek and lowly. Uh, and yet also victorious. And uh, in that character of being mild and retiring, he had the victory and his unction and power through it. It's a lovely picture of the Savior. And then in verse 21, uh, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Well, already we've heard the mention of the Gentiles in Matthew, and here again, um, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Uh, of course, referring back to uh, Isaiah 42. I just know this. Uh, the mention of the Gentiles goes hand in hand with the bruised reed and smoking flax. And I just say that sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. Forget we are sinners saved by grace. And uh, there can be things like you know, there's various trends today of Christian nationalism and all that, and uh, making out your, your nation to be great. And I think it's so abominable that we are talking. Uh, we are Gentiles, my friend. I know sometimes every country thinks they're the center of the universe. Uh, and uh, we are Gentiles. And uh, the Lord has had mercy upon us. Uh, we are the bruised reed and the smoking flax, the pagans of the world. The Lord has had mercy upon us. If I can say as an aside, I'm very much against this talk of the great heritage and uh, what a shame we've lost it. I don't know, there's something in that that's wrong, the exalting of nations and not sinners saved by grace. Uh, those in gospel times and rather revival times did not speak like that. The true language is this, we are a sinful nation. and We pray of God, have mercy upon us. And if we have a great history, it's not because of us. It was the previous grace of God. Don't get ahead of yourself. Remember, you're a sinner saved by grace. And all our nations are sinful nations. We need the mercy of God. That is evangelical speaking. And not this idea of, you know, what a great nation we've been and what a terrible shame that things have gone the way they have. We were never a great nation. We knew the grace of God. And if there was any greatness, it was glory to God alone. Remember that, my friend, remember that. Because that is the gospel spirit. And that's where you find, sometimes you find even Unbelievers, you know, in uh, better times, talk like that. A Abraham Lincoln, his great speech. He speaks of America as a sinful, guilty nation, crying to God for mercy. He wasn't a Christian. And we need to speak like that. That is the language. That is the language. Uh, we are sinners saved by grace. And I note here that the Gentiles are in the same breath as the bruised reed and the smoking flax. God has shown us mercy, and mercy upon our nations, but more to the point upon our own souls. Well, these words here in verse uh, 21 uh, speak of gospel days which will follow. The Gentiles will trust in Jesus Christ, it says. Um, no doubt Matthew is saying this here, bringing in Ma uh, Isaiah, because he's aware of the Gentiles that had come to Christ on the shores of Galilee. 
And he made him think of Isaiah 42, a promise of the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles will trust in Jesus Christ. An astounding statement to the Jews uh, of the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. But it's so clear, isn't it, in Isaiah and also here uh, in the New Testament. The Gentiles will believe in Jesus Christ. Is another picture of us here tonight where we are crowded around the word of God where Christ is exalted, we are pressing upon Christ. Uh, we are thronging him. We are the Gentiles. Christ is in this word. We're doing the same. Uh, we come to the shores of Galilee. Christ is being preached. And then men and we have believed in Jesus Christ. Because some may not have, there was leave room for that, even in the midweek meeting just present you tonight for those any here who have not truly touched Christ and known him as their own saviour. See the two things again, the wonder uh, of the great gospel and of Calvary and the power of Christ to save us from our sins. The great strength of that, uh, the plan of redemption. But then this great message and a strong message we are sinners, we shall die in our sins, we shall be <coughs> condemned forever in the judgment of God, in the hell prepared, unless we trust in Jesus Christ. It's a strong message, a powerful message, but said in kind and tender tones, uh, with the spirit of a man, the God-man Jesus Christ, full of kindness, dealing with your soul. Surely that's what you want, of course, when if you were speaking to a pastor about your soul, you'd want that moment of kindness as well as the clarity of the gospel. And in Christ we see that, and I say to those here tonight, you have in Jesus Christ the perfect saviour and the perfect gospel. Believe in him, touch him. He is the saviour. He's full of wonder, full of truth, of tenderness. He is just the kind of saviour you would want. And so he can save you tonight. Well, touch his garment, touch him with your heart and soul so that you might be healed in your soul. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we ask now, O Lord, that thou would come through the words of scripture and testify to us of the nature of our gospel and the nature of our saviour. Although there is great power and unction upon the preaching of the word, he himself was meek and lowly and would warm our hearts, would melt our hearts if he was here in person with us tonight. And yet he is. He is here with us. And we pray that our hearts might be melted in his presence and also moved uh, with the powerful, important and gospel truths. Lord, help us to strike this balance of, of truth and grace. Uh, let us be like our Savior in all manner of way. And, O oh Lord, that thou would bless us uh, with his presence in our midst. Oh, that he might be in our midst, uh, where two or three are gathered in his name. He has promised to be in our midst. As we pray now, O oh Lord, we might feel his nearness. And we ask these things to the glory of God. Amen. Let's uh, sing that, uh, what we believe is a John Calvin hymn, 292. It says the Strasbourg Psalter, so we, many of us believe it's John Calvin. I greet thee, whom I shall redeem a rat. 292, shall we stand? <laughs>
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.